One of the sweetest things right now trending on social media has to be the movie Black Book, The Black Book. And I spoke about it earlier on the show and I said I'm going to have the director of the movie right here with me in the studio. It is one of the sweetest things going on right now on social media. Peter Ruby is talking about it. The presidency is talking about it. I remember put out a very emotional, heartwarming post about it. I have seen the movie and I said I'm, I'm not going to talk about the movie until I have the director here and he's in the building. How are you feeling, Mediti? Hi. You are the sweetest thing right now on social media. Yeah. <laughs> My name is Aditya Fiong. Yes. Director of Black Book. I'm excited to be here. Are you excited to be here? Actually, I am. I, am. Yeah. I, I was I was in a meeting this morning. I've been in meetings since mm -hmm. we released the film, and it's. it's I'm struggling to hear you, bro. Can you come closer to the mic? Okay. Um, can you hear better now? I don't think so. I don't have a, a big radio voice. Yes, you don't. <laughs> so I'm um, trying to figure out how to get the voice out. So. Um, I, I speak okay. through I speak through the picture. Yes, it's cool. <laughs> I can hear you now. It's cool. Okay, yeah. go on. Um but I like it's been it's been really great seeing the entire world like go like gaga for a Nigerian film. Yes. Like um it's it's been number one in South Korea for days. Hmm. I think that's the thing that is like stuck with me. The South Korea one because yeah. they are very particular about their movies. Yes. <laughs> they have a huge film industry. They do and and the film industry is amazing. Mm -hmm. The pictures are amazing. It's, yep. it's, they produce some of the most like crispiest yes, they do. pictures. With beautiful stories. Yeah. And the Black Book has been a consistent number one. I know the Caribbean, we, we, we are good. We're good. You know, South the America Africans, is we're good. looking at the map. It's, it's been trending. It had been trending like one or two. The entire South America. Uh, North America has been top three, top five. But Asia... <laughs> G-Man. <laughs> mm, that one, you didn't see coming. I did not see that one coming. Okay, so um, this movie has been, people have been raving about it and talking about it on social media for a couple of days since it dropped. And I can't lie, that was the first place I saw it was on social media. I saw, I think I, I saw Kiki Mori Twitter about it first. Then I saw a couple of my mutuals talk about how they were going to go check the movie out. And I'm like, okay, you know what, I'm going to watch this movie then i'm um, you know goodness what i think about it personally because i am a very big fan of nollywood movies i saw jago jago earlier this and i loved it and i'm like okay you know what let me go check this one out and i started watching it i'm like okay this is absolutely amazing the storytelling of this movie is amazing well before we even get into the storytelling you are a first time director talk about that one first time feature director first time yeah. directing a feature film yes yeah. and there were days on set when I thought maybe I should have just done Bedroom and Palo, you know, <laughs> because it was so hard. You know, we shot in Lagos, uh, went to Kaduna, came mm -hmm. back and shot some more in Lagos for almost four months. Mm -hmm. And in Lagos, we shot um, we shot in Lagos Island, shot in Balogu, for example, mm -hmm. which is quite challenging. And then we went to Tarpa mm -hmm. Bay, we had to have barges, you know take trucks from Lagos mainland to the Takwa Bay. Hmm. Um, in Kaduna, we had to build roads. Yeah. Um, build build a, roads? Yeah. And a temporary, like, airstrip type situation okay. for, for the set. Um, we did all kinds of things. And, and it's, it's the biggest film by scale done by Nigerian ever. Yes. Um, we shot at the Lagos port. You know, Papa. I saw that one. Uh, that that picture. Like, <laughs> I the saw scale that one. Of it, like, I saw that one. And I, I'm really grateful to the cast and crew, because it was sometimes it felt like an impossible thing to do, but I remember the first day I met with my crew. Mm -hmm. I walked into the room, and this is me, the least experienced person in the room, because this, uh, these guys are like veterans mm -hmm. know, crew who've done mm -hmm. everything, and I'm like. You know what? We're gonna make the biggest film ever out of Nigeria, and it's gonna be the biggest project of your lives. And it's not gonna be easy, but if we do what we have to do, we're gonna make the biggest film ever done out of this country. And everyone's looking at me like, "What's he saying?" What's this one? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I was the least experienced person in the room, mm -hmm. but I'm really grateful that we we all worked together. It was really hard, mm -hmm. and. You know that thing that say we made magic mm -hmm. and everyone says it and the world would see the magic that we made actually the world is actually seeing the magic that we made hmm. i can't lie the movie definitely feels like you made magic on different levels from the cast and crew 
to the story. Everything feels very intentional. So the location, it feels like you paid attention to everything that you were working on. And that is not something that we that should be taken for granted. Do you understand? Because we talk about how for Nigeria, we talk about music as our exports, talk about things that are pay, people are paying attention to. Nollywood is definitely one of those things that we need to, we've been speaking about, but we need to talk about it even more because look at what the world is saying about this movie. And um, Afrobeat is big. We can give the same energy to Nollywood. What do you think? Uh, we, I think we are having our Afrobeat moment right now. <laughs> <laughs> With the black book, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but um, it wasn't by accident. Mm. I think I think that's the thing that has to be said. Yeah. And this is the moment where I pay respects to, to Yinka Edward mm. and Pat Nebo. May soul rest in peace. Pat okay. Nebo passed a few days before the film was released. Mm. And I'm really glad that we were able to honor him in the film. Mm-hmm. Uh, when, when he died we, we had a conversation with Netflix and you know when you submit the film to Netflix yeah. it's locked and they're like they unlocked it so we can put a memoriam for him so, and then we caught a, a trailer I had caught a, a trailer to be released uh, yeah. the week before yeah. uh, the film was, was a few days before the film released but we, we adjusted that it, it felt almost prophetic in the way it says you may never see me again Yes. But I give you one last task. I give you one last task. Yeah, it was like Pat Nebo was speaking to yes. us. And and there's a shot, okay, in the film where he just made a little salute. And it was like, salute, bow out. And I met with his family a few days later. And yeah. I'm, I'm really glad that the world is seeing his legacy. Yeah. He always told me, he called me the ocean wave. And he, he when he, he told me that this is the, the biggest film he has done, this is his best work. Yeah. I... I mean, it's Pat Nebo, right? Yes. Um, so I was like, oh, please stop watching me. Stop but watching me. It almost felt like... He saw this coming. Yes. Um, so I'm really glad we could honor him, like, honor him that way. Yeah. But speaking about the intentionality of it, we built 38 sets in an out of studio. Let's say um, the police station in the film. Yes. Where Vic goes to... Yes. Him, that was built from scratch. That's not a real police station? No. Where did you build that? <laughs> in studio so um because when you see the film we shot vic is coming in and then yeah. we shot from behind to see this inside of the cell yes how do you think that was done it's i it's, don't know it's a set so you build it so you can like you can track from behind so there's it's a, a room with one a room has four walls yes but when you, you build that you build three walls the other one is empty so you can track and can film from behind the market scene, yeah. the market scene, and the um where he goes to meet uh that lady character. I'm, I don't want to spoil the film for people. Me, yeah, I'm going to spoil. We have seen the movie because we no. have questions <laughs> no, now. We'll do. Do that. Now, the now market I'm scene. Afraid. The market scene. Which of the market scenes? When he goes to meet Big Daddy. Okay. Peruvian jacquard. Okay. See yeah, when yeah, you walk yeah, through yeah, the market. Yeah, yeah. That's not Balogo. We went to on a Sunday morning. Mm-hmm. It was e- Balogun on Sunday morning is just empty streets. Yes, it is. Built up all the stalls and brought three hundred extras. And so they just made, people are just standing still. And that action, people start moving. What? Yeah, I actually thought that was like a regular day you in Balogun. You could not control a market crowd. Oh. That's why you build sets. That's why you oh. build. Oh, yes. oh my god! It, this was mid COVID. RMD is 59 at this point. So we had that many extras. Hmm. We had to test everyone who was going to have so that like, oh. so he can, he, he doesn't have to wear a mask. Yes. You can't wear a mask while watching yes. the film. Yes. So we were testing for COVID. Like, like On mine. set. Yes. We tested every week and then everyone who had to come in, we had green bands. You don't have a green band. You can't get into like where we're shooting. But then... Um, we had a new art director come in. He's a very popular guy with the crew. We tested him. He tested negative. But then his COVID showed up. And But the problem was he had like interacted with everyone. We had 10 cases. Oh had to my shut God. down. Yeah. Had to shut down the set for 10 days, which means two weeks. Which yeah. means 20% of your shooting budget is gone. Now, let's talk about that budget. I saw RMD's post where he spoke about how at some point you ran out of money and you had to start using your personal fund to yeah. do this and yeah. you didn't tell anyone. <laughs> Did you feel stretched financially? I mean... Be we, honest. We, um, we, we looked at a 750k budget. $1,000 a year. 
and we raised money for it and by the time we got to Kaduna we we're out of money actually so no no it was 650 we were out of money and I, I think the first thing I did I'd, I'd invested in a, an instrument I just went pulled down like that that investment and started work I went to my investors um, because I'm the biggest investor I went to them and said this has happened I've already put more money into this but I would need help and uh, I think I think the people I worked with my investors that's why like nobody talks about EPs mm-hmm. but I've, I've been I've been very loud in the praise of my investors mm. they were like you know what this is what it takes to do this Abby don't worry let's we'll give you the money let's do it what and it also I think it helps that skin in the game is very important I had skin in the game I, I put my money where my mouth was mm-hmm. um, yes was it easy no no because yeah you think you're doing the right thing you think you're making the film you want to make but it's still a financial risk it's easy financial risk yeah. it's easy financial risk no, I, I, I've come out learning that if you believe in a thing and put everything into it the world will see it <laughs> the story <laughs> the story editor um it was triggering the story was triggering it was honest it was brutally honest but it was triggering do you have where did you get the story from real life experiences or you know just hearing from other people because i know that prior to you shooting this movie prior to you directing this movie you are a very socially conscious and politically aware person i follow your tweets i follow your your stories that you post on social media i see how hands-on you are about issues that affect young people i see how hands-on you were with the entire situation you were very present you were very supportive so this is not you just writing a story this is not you just telling a story because you feel like people are going to gravitate towards it i feel like there's some personal investment in that storytelling for you as someone who has been active and who is very very politically aware a few things as i say about i say about these things first films are made for audiences films are made for audiences for people to see yeah and films are supposed to make people feel yes something if if a film does not make me feel something then yeah it does not it doesn't it, it should not exist but very importantly yeah. art must reflect society society and society must reflect art it's a symbiosis it's it's yin and yang mm-hmm. and so um we wrote this we started writing the black book in 2019 mm-hmm. and we were in pre-production um in 2020 mm-hmm. and so by the time insars actually affected the production because we had to shift to production because you had a story before insars yeah we wrote the story in 2019 so it wasn't inspired by that no <laughs> um, there are pictures of me and Bumi on my office floor, surrounded by paper on the wall, on, on the floor. Um, Before entries. This was, um, I think, March 2019. What? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So when entries happened, you, did you have like a gotcha moment? Like, oh my god, the movie. I was thinking this. No. So I, I think think about this. Entries was a culmination of of a feeling that I yes and so it was not a thing that just started yes there were different there were always people who wondered there was an NSARS hashtag long before that yes there was but I work in tech I work in advertising yes. you work with young people yes and you're always having to bail people out because they got arrested because they I mean artistic people yes people, Do, yeah they the way they look hair. everything and so it was important to me to tell a story that did reflect that reality for yeah. young people. Yeah. I'm, I'm a straddler of generations. Yeah. You know, I'm 40 years old. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I don't. don't you don't look it. No, no, no. Yes. <laughs> but I'm 40 years old. I straddle, I straddle two different generations. Um, not by age, but by interaction. And I yeah. work with a lot of young people. Yeah. And it was important for me to tell a story that empowers them. Yeah. But then it's also a story of grief. And it I'm, is. Grief is a subject I'm rather too familiar with. Hmm. As a person. As a person. 
And so it, you see in the grief of Paul Adima, people often write grief as hysterical, but there was an internalization that boils over in the moments his son dies. Yes. And beyond that moment of internalization, uh, uh, externalization, he, he always internalized his pain. Yes. Um, so it's it's in the it's almost a reflection of how I have I have come to process grief. Uh, but beyond that, you know, you always have to, where do we go from here? Yep. Where do we go from here? Now, yes. Now, it was important to me that we do not make Paul a hero. Paul is my hero because, I mean, yeah. The way he went about that. <laughs> the way he went about that. Yeah. But I have some questions, okay. right? Of course, definitely. I'm going to, the part where I had to pause I'm going to read out some part of the movie. This part where um, I think it was... Okay, yes, not I think. It was Alex Osifo who said this. He yeah. said, in this country, there has always been a hierarchy. People like okay. you, people like, people like me, then bloody civilians. civilians. I give orders, you follow orders, and civilians, ship as they are, they will be. We allow them... This is the part that I personally felt triggered. We allow them a sense of democratic freedom, but retain power and knowledge. So their delusions of liberal society do not lead to anarchy. I feel like that person was speaking about the story of a regular Nigerian, a young person in Nigeria. Because a lot of times there's a, there's this delusion where we feel like we are the leaders of tomorrow. And we've been channeling and saying that for the longest, but it feels like that we never get to experience that part of it. This was my translation of this part. Like as a young person in Nigeria, I it's the same way we feel delusional about a lot of things. How how do you expect us as young people to take in that part of the movie? When you when you wrote that line, what were you thinking? What were you expecting us to feel in that moment? Because I sat down, I had to pause that part. I sat for a minute. I wrote it down. This was even Guess what, Editi? This was even before I knew I was going to interview you. I wrote this down for my personal consumption. And in that moment, I texted my friend and said, this is so real. And it feels like as young people, at some point, we need to ask ourselves, how long do we intend to stay delusional? I do not think that there's actually anything delusional about wanting happiness. Hmm. There is nothing delusional about the pursuit of happiness. Every hmm. human being is entitled or should be entitled to happiness. Mm. And I want to say that this was a love letter to my country. Mm. And everything that I've needed to say, I have said. Um, however, it wasn't just a Nigerian story. Yeah. I have seen spikes of this film in Pakistan. I'm getting messages from Pakistan, from mm -hmm. Colombia, from Panama. Mm. <laughs> mm different corners of the world yeah and i think that message resonates not just for nigerian young people yeah for young people all over the world yeah <laughs> we we must not settle we cannot settle we must always be on that journey towards happiness towards towards where we need to be mm. i don't know how we're going to do it Hmm. But everything we have done in the history of our country and all the countries around the world brings us to this moment. Mm -hmm. so the question has always been, what next? What next? What do we do? Yeah. <sighs> the young people have to decide what they want to do. I'm too old now. <laughs> really? <laughs> okay. But, but you... That was a moment for me in that movie. And as a young person, seeing that, as a young person who has fought through different situations, especially as a woman. So ours is like multi-layered. We have to fight society. We have to fight the government. The same thing that, you know, there's some, there's some things that we have to fight for that might not be general fights for everyone. Okay. I actually see you. Okay. And there's a lot of subtext in the picture that, in the film, that yeah. you, some people miss. Yeah. Vic is visiting Paul in yes. prison. Yes. What happened to her? Did you notice what happened to her? She's a woman. She's a yes, child. yes, what she happened? is. The cat calling. Yes. The cat calling. Yes, I saw that. There were people 
who are literally in jail, jail. When yeah they're trying to assault her yes right from their jail from the cell i saw that i saw yeah. that and she's terrified i saw I, that it's important that we see these things and yeah. we call out this thing. yeah and it was also very important to me that the role of women in the film hmm chi chi yeah Shirley Reynolds. Yes. <laughs> and that has gone viral yes. around the world. Yes, I've seen that one. And um, we, well, I'm waiting for my Chichi Share the Ground, my Share the Ground t shirt. It's okay. coming in. It's coming in. Yeah. Um, I would like to see that one. That was also a very, very important part of the movie. Yeah. I, I, it was important for me that, you know, women are the solution. Women have always been the solution to our country, we, uh, to, to situations in our country. Yeah. I, I, I'm a product of strong women. Mm. My mother had me. At 20 she could have given up hmm. my mother is the most important person in my life hmm. you know I have grown up you know like just her strength continues to push you yes pushing through every difficult situation yeah and and I had to write something in honor of that of the women who raised me my grandmother yeah. Yeah. my mother had me and I was one year old she had to she had to go get her higher degree and she she did. left me with my grandmother. My grandmother raised me with yeah. her army of children who are also young. Um, yeah, I had to honor these strong, amazing women in my life um, that who raised me by writing that. I I married to like one well, of the smartest people in the world, you know. And um, people look at me like you, you're really smart. I'm like you don't. Have you met my Yeah, my my son is like is like brilliant brilliant he's in a, a gifted program in a, and 90 percent of the things he knows like it wasn't on me i <laughs> teach i teach bike riding i, yeah. I teach design and things yeah. like that but like the the core things yeah yeah it is from so it was important for me to acknowledge that role and in, in in showing how women who, who are part of the solution mostly part of the solution and in the way they do things you know, men punch through walls. Women found find the cracks in the world and walk in without you seeing them. They invaded the entire place, and no one saw that coming. Hmm. You know, that was that was a spiritual <laughs> thing. Hmm. That we I made. can't I can't even lie. That was a moment because I was just there looking at the guy. Like you, so you really think that you're gonna. This is the end of the road, and he was yeah. feeling really proud of himself. I'm trying not to spoil it, yeah. but the way the women came in I was am amazing. A woman. <laughs> but the casting, you did a fantastic work with Daniela Gray, and I think he did fantastic as an actor in that movie. I know that I see people saying, "Oh my God, how did he get casted as an assassin?" He was actually much bigger than that. He had built like serious muscle. But had COVID, oh, and lost it all. I oh, he built the muscle for the role. Yeah, so RMD and him were in the same gym. I was also like my cast are working out, so I was working out too. Yeah, we're pretty buff. You know? Okay, and I had COVID, lost everything. I lost weight. And um, Denla too. Yeah, Denla had the same situation. But without the muscle, he did fantastic. He was he very did. believable. His yeah. face. There was just something about the yeah. way he looked. Like he so looked we moved, like we moved all of the energy into his his carriage like his yeah. mannerism yeah, yeah yeah and he did really good with that one so shout out to Dylan O'Grath I think he killed it, killed it. I, I, I love to see him as an assassin more <laughs> <laughs> who knows, who knows? <laughs> are you an assassin <laughs> but also aside from Dylan O'Grey we have RMD we have Bimbo Akitala we have a lot of fantastic fantastic Nollywood actors how did you decide who was perfect for what role how did you find you know Dylan O'Grey would do well here RMD would do well here I wrote the script for RMD. From the beginning? Yeah. I remember writing um, Big Daddy and I was like, yeah. First of all, Shafi Bella was the lead in my first, my short film. Okay. And I was like, yeah. She's well, fantastic. Yeah, She's I'll, I'll, I'll work with her again. She's definitely. amazing. So, uh, we were talking last night, Shafi and I, and I was like, remember, he's like, Aditi, you told me this would be the biggest film in Nigeria. I, You knew it. You knew it. And I remember when we had that conversation, I was like, I'm going to send you the script. I promise I'll send you a script. Read the scripts. I don't. I'm not gonna cast you, but tell me what character you want to be. And she came. I came in and was like, I want to be Big Daddy. I want to be Big Daddy. Yes. I'm like, of course. I wanted to give you Big Daddy. I wanted, I wanted you to 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 bond with the character while reading yeah, the script. Yeah. That it wasn't a thing that I I I wrote it for you. I wrote it. For but you. I wanted to be sure that I you see you too. connected to it. 
RMD, RMD was on the project for 13 months. So when you see that performance, mm. it was born of having spent time with the character, mm. become one with the character. We are on set and I'm trying to talk to RMD and I'm speaking to Paul Edima. It's, it, it's a different thing. Paul Edima is a man of like, it's, it's mm. like a hand grenade. There's so much violence and rage so much inside anger. of yes. him. Yeah. And so you're trying to speak with him and he turns around, he's, he's in character. Yeah. He's Paul Edima the entire time. Yeah. It, was, it was, I remember the day we shot his last scene on Takwa Bay and he washed his head. It's like, thank God I have to take this off of me. The character. The character. In, the character changed him. He doesn't grow his hair usually. Yeah. But, so he had to grow his hair, you know, so that he would look, uh, end up look, he, would, he had to look unthreatening. Yeah. His shirt was always two sizes up. Yeah. You know, and gray. Yeah. And the spaces he, he inhabited was gray so that he doesn't look too powerful at the beginning. And then, of course, he takes the character journey to becoming his old self, hmm. dressing like his old self, becoming his old self. Hmm. It was very uh, intentional. intentional. But for the casting, I felt I was more like a kid in a candy store who ends up getting all the candy. You actually did get all the candy because yeah. how do you have a movie with Bibi Wakitela, Shafi, Bello, Sandy? I was like, these are the people I want. These are RMD, the people I, like, I woke up one morning and I had 99%. You know? What? Yes. Uh, there was only one actor I wanted that I didn't because he was unwell. Who's that now? Uh, okay, two. Okay, so um, I wouldn't say the name, but like oh. he came on set, he came on set and tested positive to COVID. Oh, yeah. So you mentioned something about RMD. Oh my God, this interview, you said like 10 minutes, how many minutes now? <laughs> you said something about RMD washing his head off the last day of, yeah. you know, his, his last scene. He had lived with the character. I think one thing that we do not talk about enough, I'm going to ask you if you play any role in that now as a, as a director, is how actors need to shed off those characters when they are done with the movie especially if the character was not a fantastic one is there a process to them going back to being themselves before yeah. that movie that they have to go we, through we had to have conversation uh -huh. i remember speaking with that day after because it's easy to write a likable character it's easy to very to take a likable character yes. and embody that person but Ade was going to play a character we knew audiences would absolutely be annoyed with. Yeah. A very annoying character. So, mm. so villains, you know, people revere villains. Yes. They love yeah. heroes. Yeah. But annoying characters receive hate. <laughs> but so we had to like walk through that process of you. Yeah. Like finding joy in people hating the character. Yes. Because that's what the character that's yes. when you know I did the job. And hmm. remember, films have to make you feel. Yes, you have to feel something. That annoying character makes you feel like you love this person. You wish this person would not make this decision. Yeah. But they keep making the decision. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> but between you and I, Edith, yeah. the way Polydema went about fighting for the honor of his son, I see why. I understand the rage. I see why he had to do that. But mm. I also feel like he could only do that from a place of privilege. There's so many Polydema sons and daughters that won't get that kind of honor, especially in countries like Nigeria. I'm going to read your line. Read me a line. How many young men, do you know how many young men have been killed? You know, so the question was, no one speaks for them. Yes. Yes. On a pretext of being criminal. Do you know yes. how many young men have been killed yeah. on a pretext of being criminals? Yeah. No one speaks for them. Speaks for them. Yeah. That line began his journey. See, I I that was an admission of privilege. You have the privilege, you have this thing. So she did not know who he was, but you have the evidence to potentially yeah. you know, bring justice. And justice for one can indeed be justice for all. We have seen the more bad situation right now. Yes, we have. And you see an industry and a people rising for one person. Yes, and we've never seen before. Yes, and there is the point. Do you know how many other people have died without people rising to defend them? Yes. To find justice for them? Yes. It always, always takes one person. To start the conversation. Thank you so much, Edith Fian, for coming through. This was a very insightful conversation. 
thoroughly enjoyed it. I'm so happy for all your wins. Everyone is going bonkers about this movie. I saw RMD talk about how he never watches his movie, but he would watch this one when he gets a number one. Has he seen it now? RMD, have you seen it now? I didn't see Up North for till 2023. Have you seen this one though? I, oh, I have. I actually have enjoyed this. Okay. I have enjoyed this. I think the thing that really triggered me about Up North was that I had a cameo in it. I would never do that again. <laughs> <laughs> And like, you're not the only one i hate I my i hate my voice if i have to hear my voice out like i can relate to that like i'm, I'm not going to play back I on this absolutely hate oh my, my own voice i i hate looking at myself on screen oh my god yeah so i can i can imagine uh, but i mean he he gotta he gotta watch it i'm sure he's saying it now because he's like number one he's okay, when he gets there's it, an it. entire ceremony we're gonna do a ceremony to get him, him to watch, watch it okay he has like this nice throne in his house. I okay. call it a throne it's okay. a nice high chair okay we're gonna sit down there and peel his eye yeah well yeah what because he did fantastic and i, I he did amazing shout out to you you are an amazing no, ama- shout out to him no, say shout out to you. I'm speaking to him now. Oh, hey. I was, Hi, about, to, I was about to say that. I'm like, shout out to you. Then I wanted to go on and say, you are a legend and we are so honored and so blessed to have your talent and to see you continue to do what you do. RMD, we are so inspired and we love you. And every other cast, every other person that was in this movie did amazing. There was no one in this movie that was unbelievable. They did fantastic. Shout out to you, the producers and everyone who worked on it. It's such an inspiring, beautiful story told. And um, shout out to Nollywood. Shout to Nollywood. We're winning. I, I've said this several times. I said it again today. Nollywood, this is your time. This is your time. Thank you, Nollywood. <laughs> thank you, Nollywood. And thank you for everyone who continues to believe in Nollywood. Absolutely. And thank you for the for the investors, too. Shout out to the investors. They did fantastic. And shout out to you. A first-time director of a future film. You wrote a story. Did you also work on the casting? And yeah, I casted with Lala. Yeah. <laughs> And you also got Lala Lala on this one. I saw her there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I saw her in the credits. Shout out to Lala too. You guys did amazing. It'd be so nice to see you do another thing. I'm sure that will take a while. Is there anything in the works? Um, we're shooting in January. I can't say what oh. it is. So that means you're never going back in the day. Um, never. I ever. always say that my last film is my. It will be the smallest, worst thing I have ever done. Huh. Yeah. Okay, so this is not the last time we're hearing from Aditya film when it comes to Nollywood. Oh uh, no, no, it's we're not. shooting in January and it's. Fantastic. So, yeah. You already have it set. Yeah, I we have a five year slit. What? Yeah, we have a five year slit. In twenty eighteen we wrote a story. Yeah. Um it's an entire universe. Uh we created an entire universe mm-hmm. for um our African fantasy. Mm-hmm. The day I make that film, I, I used to say the day I make that film I'm gonna retire. Mm-hmm. But I'm realizing that I might make it in two years. <laughs> Okay, big dreams, ADC. I like it. I'm, me, me, I'm just excited to be watching the movie, Sha. I'm just excited to be watching the movie and talking to you. Hopefully, maybe the next interview, we have all the cast or some of them join you in the interview and make it a large party. Yeah, who knows? But that, I, my cast, I enjoy the time of the <laughs> film. I'm, 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 not them. Sure. I'm working for them right now. So you're Let, them enjoy them. Let them enjoy because, it. Oof, they deserve it. They deserve it. And the location and the, the everything was so intentional. So it's like I just can like, just keep giving accolades. It's it's endless. Thank you so much for coming through. Um, it was so nice talking to you about the movie, the Black Book. It's a show on Netflix. I, why Netflix though? Why did you choose Netflix? It's the biggest uh, film platform in the world. Absolutely. Yeah, you heard can it. I, can I get a song request? A song request? Sure. Okay. What song? Uh, Black Skin Head. By who now? Kanye West. Oh, Kanye West. No, but Black Skin Head. You know what you see why when you play this. Uh, let me see if I have that one here. Let me see. I hope he didn't curse. Did he curse? If mm-hmm. he did curse, then it can't be there. Did he curse? Uh, you should have a clean version. Well, but I have to be sure that he didn't. He he, he did curse. I like just first phrase. It doesn't curse in the first phrase. <sighs> oh my god! I'm gonna cost you a fine. Yes, you're gonna cost me a fine. No. <laughs> what, did you, what, did you, what did you say? Okay, a song for Dulu. Do you have a song for Dulu? What's the title now? A song for Dulu. A song for Dulu. Dinachi. From who now? It's the, uh, the soundtrack, official soundtrack of the Black Book. Of the Black Book. Let me now see. A song. I don't think I have that. Oof. I don't have that. Mm. Sorry. Now you're going to have to find it. Oh my God. 